record here. Uh, so we have uh, with us today, uh, we have Ben Stewart. Um, he is a 2015 graduate of the Schreier Honors College at Penn State University with degrees in Spanish and Russian. He worked at Penn State as a teaching assistant and research assistant before joining the Peace Corps to serve in Ukraine in 2016, where he spent just over two years teaching English, designing and carrying out grant-based project work and developing his Russian and Ukrainian language skills. Since completing his service, he has worked as a freelance interpreter translator on a wide variety of projects from TV shows to full length books to video games and less captivating things uh, as well that he says don't really belong in a bio necessarily. So um, <laughs> he'll, uh, he'll elaborate a little bit more. He has a, a short presentation uh, for you all uh, for us, but um, you also, we encourage you to, um, if you've got any questions for Ben, um, there is a Q&A box. There's also a chat box. So you can use both of those and we will make sure that we get your questions answered. So um, with that, Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and taking time out of your schedule today. Well, of course, thank you very much for having me, Stacey. Um, and again, yes, to everybody that is listening, since I obviously cannot hear you, I would ask you all to please, if you have these questions or things pop up and you wanna know a little more details, I'd be happy to elaborate on anything because um, I'm going to try to not spend a lot of time talking just about me. I'd rather talk about skills, activities, experiences that were relevant in order to kind of make this as useful as possible as I can. Um, I am going to apologize for this right off the bat because I know that everybody is sick to death of PowerPoints given the whole COVID climate. So again, I'm just gonna go the brief uh, summary of my personal history as it relates to language work and then we'll do a little bit of a conversation on language center work and freelancing, which is currently what I'm spending most of my time on. So we'll start with my background. Uh, as has already been laid out, I had two degrees from Penn State uh, and a minor. So you can see them up on the screen. The applied Spanish was a bachelor's of science. That's a little bit relevant. Uh, if you're thinking about doing things that re require more quantitative work, linguistics, lab work, looking at grad school, maybe PhD, postdoc, um, it has a little bit more of the flavor there. So it's not just you're going to Spanish 101, learning how to order a taco, but there was statistics involved and I had to write my thesis, of course. So the Russian degree speaks for itself. Um, and linguistics minor, you'll see below in italics my activities that I consider to be relevant to the language work that I'm doing now. Uh, and again, I'll be happy to elaborate on any of these. So feel free to screen cap this, or if you need to write it down or throw a question in the chat, please let me know. Um, Pyre is a grant, it's a fellowship more specifically offered by the PSU Linguistics Department. And it, it's just you teaming up with a linguistics professor, coming up with a research project that is novel, traveling abroad to carry it out, um, collecting data, traveling back home, and then analyzing it. So obviously this dovetailed very neatly into my thesis. I went to Spain in the summer of 2013 to collect uh, linguistics data on Spanish English bilinguals. And I wrote a very long, boring paper on it that no one will ever read. Um, Conversation Partners is the next one. And that was very, very relevant. I'm joking about the thesis. It was very relevant for grad school, but we'll get to that. Conversation Partners was a volunteer program that I was involved with for most of my time as an undergrad. Uh, I think seven out of my six or seven of my eight semesters at Penn State, I was doing Conversation Partners, which means meeting with international students. Some of you that are, you know, I apologize if some of you are already familiar with the program. Um, but conversation partners is you meeting up with international students and working on some aspect of their English. So I accumulated basically through the conversation partners program, a large volume of informal teaching hours. CLS is the critical language scholarship. Uh, it sent me to Russia in the summer of 2014 for intensive Russian language study, which I then basically came back to the States in August of that year, swapped my visas over and turned around to go back to a study abroad in St. Petersburg for a semester. Um, and the CLS and the study abroad are two very, very different animals, very, very different animals, but they each had their pluses and minuses. 
And then my graduating semester, I was a TA for Russian, the equivalent of Russian 102, so second semester Russian. And I was doing everything that involves, you know, that TA work involves. It's, um, teaching the class when the professor was away, doing tutoring, um, going over sessions and things like that with students, grading, answering questions, prepping for tests, and so on. Uh, after I graduated in 2015, I had two jobs, each part-time, just because of the way that Penn State sets up contracts. So the big one, I say the big one, <laughs> because it was the one that I held on to for a longer period of time, was working as a research assistant for a professor uh, at PolySci. And that involved me doing a lot of Russian translation, um, categorizing it, classifying it, and summarizing articles from Russian news stories. So it was um, of the relevant skills below, it definitely hit on translation and data entry. Um, and that was very demanding and definitely was a big push on my language skills uh, after I got back from Russia. I also was a teaching assistant for PSU Linguistics for a semester with an adjunct professor. That got me even more a transition from informal to formal classroom instruction. And again, hopped on linguistics. The teach professor that I worked with, pardon me, she's a professor, was very, 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 um, I, I don't know, she was just great to work for. She had the things that she was good at and she let me uh, kind of spread my wings a little bit, if you want to put it that way. So I handled the areas of linguistics that I was particularly knowledgeable about coming off my thesis in that pyre, and she did the classes that she was good at, and we still even have a relatively, well, we still have an amicable relationship to this day. It was a very good semester, actually. But point is, continuing along the timeline here, after graduation, which is fall 2015 for me, I applied for Peace Corps and grad programs which is the subject of the next slide. Um, I was very fortunate um, to have to make a choice between grad school and Peace Corps. So I did get in to the places that I applied. And I can discuss, I guess, briefly what kind of graduate school programs I was going for. They were largely, they weren't strictly area studies programs. Those of you that are familiar with language work know that there are things like Russian area studies or, um, you know, you just pick a specific region where you're basically going to concentrate on, and that's the thing that you're going to do, but it's still relatively generalist. So I was applying for things that generally had a quantitative component, be it stats or econ, uh, and which, which is why I have this kind of divided here into two fields for each experience, like things that I feel helped me get into grad school would definitely be the work experience that I had. I didn't go straight from undergrad to grad school. Um, I was out in the world, if you want to think about it that way, making my own income and using skills that, again, I had cultivated through my undergraduate. And admissions directors like this, program directors like this, I know this because I met with them personally, or I could. Um, in one case, with a university in New York, I met with the director personally, he was kind enough to invite me for a tea, and also through email exchanges. So this is not me. Um, blowing smoke. This is me having conversations with people who evaluated my credentials and my criteria, and they said, we appreciated that you did X. Um, for any kind of area study language center program, obviously, you need the language skills. That's your ticket in. And experience in the relevant region helped, as did my thesis. When I say things that didn't seem to matter so much with an asterisk there, it's because you have to study for the GREs. but. If you're going for a language program, they're not going to care if you don't have a perfect score. Uh, so it's not the end-all, be-all of your graduate school application. You, need, you, know, you should have the ability to focus on something that's much more relevant to the degree you're trying to get. An undergraduate degree, again with the asterisk. Obviously, my undergraduate degree gave me language skills, experience in the region, relevant work experience, scholarships, and so on that are very relevant. When I say that the undergraduate degree isn't as important, I strictly mean, oh, we got a Q&A popping up here. Yes, can I get to this, uh, Ms. Novak, can I get to that question in about three slides? I will come back to that, I promise. But um, I say this because I applied for an econ split, right? And they had 
two fields, list all the econ classes that you've taken, list all the language classes that you had taken. I had econ 102 from Penn State, which I'm sure that some of you have taken micro. And that's it to go for a graduate econ degree. Whereas for the other field, which is all the language classes you've taken, I had just wall to wall, 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 you know, from all of the undergraduate cred, all of the study abroad, CLS and everything like that. Um, flip side over to the Peace Corps, I was applying to be an education volunteer, which is you're teaching English to foreign nationals in a foreign country. So things that definitely helped me out with that. And again, this was something I confirmed with a woman that interviewed me as part of the process to get into the Peace Corps was the volunteer teaching hours. I had accumulated, I wanna say 400 teaching hours over the course of four years. And that was very valuable to them. Um, the Peace Corps accepts a wide variety of people and you can choose to go wherever you'd like. There is even a button when you apply, this is just send me anywhere. If you're not like terribly picky about where you wanna go. But I was trying to view the Peace Corps as a professional development time, as opposed to a go out and kind of wander sort of time. So I wanted to go to Ukraine specifically because I wanted to continue developing in this way. And this was also at the recommendation of these grad school directors that I met with that said, you know, you already qualified, you got in, you can come back in two years and you'll be even more qualified. I wouldn't worry about it. So the door is kind of open in that regard. And anything that you do in the Peace Corps will be relevant to what you're trying to do here if you're going to Ukraine. Uh, and for the Peace Corps, if you're trying to be an English teacher, um, they really would love to see teaching hours from you, but the English teaching subfield of Peace Corps, the English teaching, I don't even know what they call it anymore. There's a technical term for it, I apologize that I've forgotten, is not as picky. The English teaching is not as picky as something like community development or health or agriculture, where they expect you to have antecedent experience in this field. Um, so that's what the double asterisk means that. Let's see if we can move on here. Peace Corps is what I wound up choosing, as you are all aware. That lasted from September 2016 to November 2018. My full official title was a nightmare. It was higher education, higher education teaching. I can't even pronounce it now. Higher education teaching English as a foreign language, otherwise known as TEFL, volunteer. And there are three main facets that I focused on. Um, TEFL volunteers generally only have to really focus on the first two here, which you'll see are formal in-class instruction. That is, a that is a term that you're looking for if you have any desire to go into ESL or anything like that. People that are going to pay you, and I mean not like the Peace Corps pays you, the Peace Corps does not pay you. You don't go to the Peace Corps to earn money. But if you're trying to be paid for English teaching, they're going to ask for in-class or formal instruction and experience relevant to that as well as TEFL methodological trainings, right? So that's capacity building. We're kind of now blurring the lines into the project management, grant management, which is, you know, then fully materializes in that third point there, grant projects. And I can talk more about those if you'd like, but that's basically taking American government money and turning it into community initiatives and English language trainings uh, for adults, camps for children, things like that. And the relevant skills you'll see below, obviously the language and cultural skills came in to play in Ukraine, as well as my formal teaching experience I got from the linguistics TA teaching assistantship. Uh, if you guys notice, there's a big just blob of grant writing, GRM, MRE, m and &E. Those are all acronyms with the exception of grant writing, obviously. And they mean approximately the same thing. So GRM is grant reporting and management. MRE is monitoring, reporting, and evaluation. And ME is monitoring and evaluation, which is all just federal government slang for putting American money, so State Department money, into foreign projects, checking on them and seeing how effective they are or are not. Soft skills is a throwaway term that people use when they're just not sure what to put on job applications. Um, but in this case, it was definitely very relevant. If you're a Peace Corps volunteer, you are on the ground surrounded by foreigners and you are very often the only American. You have to know how to talk to people and I don't wanna say be diplomatic, but you have to know how to interact with people that don't necessarily agree with you on everything. So soft skills, networking, 
community networking, finding, you know, recruiting, fundraising, grassroots level recruiting and fundraising. I mean, it definitely comes into play in Fee Score, and you definitely need soft skills for that, as well as organizational skills. Um, if you're a teacher, you need to be organized. If you're running a grant project worth several thousand dollars that Congress will look at when it goes over the Peace Corps budget, you have to be organized. That goes without saying. I'm going to take a quick look at the questions here. Oh, Heather, you have nothing to apologize for. <laughs> um, so let's see. Let's see. Let me just uh, read your question really quick for organization interest other than the ones listed. I'm going to come back to this question, I promise, because <clears throat> we're just moving into the part of the presentation that I think is more relevant to your question. When Peace Corps ended, I started freelancing uh, from November 2018 to present. I've tried a variety of platforms, and so far Upwork was the big one for me. So Upwork is not my only source of income. Uh, it is not even necessarily my primary source of income anymore, but it is definitely where I have managed to get established and from which I have built a professional network that branches out. We can talk about how you go from an online website to having your own kind of network in just a few moments. Um, but the primary services I offer, just so that we're all aware of what I can talk about, is translating, interpreting. Those are the big two. Transcription and editing and proofreading are things that come up frequently, or they tie in very frequently to translation. So people will hire me because I'm an English native speaker, and I can take a Russian text or Ukrainian text, put it into English. I edit and proofread my own work just because the mindset's involved when you're translating. Um, so again, I, you can technically call it a separate skill, but they often you know, inter, intersect with each other. Secondary services are gonna be voiceover, subtitling, and some English teaching, uh, just purely for the fact that people ask me if I do it, and there's no reason to say no to good money. Services I do not offer as a freelancer. This is just me. Uh, this is, I do not speak for all freelancers. I do not speak for other freelancers. I speak only for myself. I do not offer work into Russian or Ukrainian, only because I am not a native speaker of those languages. And I know a native speakers of the language, and I work with a native speaker of the language as well, um, that can do the work much better than I can and much more quickly. And this is not, you know, it was sort of a weird mission to make. You know, you had the language degree, you went to the Peace Corps, you did the translation gate, but you don't translate into Russian. And the reality of the situation is, no, I do not, because there is always going to be someone, a native speaker, that is going to be better with Russian or better with Ukrainian, especially because there's two languages involved here, right, than I am. So I do not offer translations into languages. Other than English, I offer translations from other languages into English. Uh, I do not offer certified translations because I am not a uh, member of a certified translation society. We can talk about that if you would like a little later. Apostilles and notarized documents are legal documents, which because I'm currently in Ukraine, I don't really have the access to an American notary and I can't get those <laughs> documents certified. So I do not offer them to my clients. Let's take a look at the Q&A here. Okay, Heather, I'm gonna read your question really quick if you don't mind. I'm planning to go in the localization field, similar to translation. Yes, it is. Do I have any recommendations for getting out there in the freelance field? I do. Do I have any recommendations for internships other than the ones listed? Uh, I believe if you're referring to language experiences in terms of internships, I could definitely pick my brain about that. You applied to CLS but got denied because it's a hard program to get into. It's an insanely hard program to get into and you should not feel bad in any way. I know many, many qualified people uh, that have applied to CLS, but the competition is nuts and the programs more than anything else are very unstable a lot of the time, but that's another discussion we can have if you would like. Lastly, do I have any recommendations for upping our language skills outside the classroom? That's an awesome question. I say I do, I absolutely do. Let's talk about types of language center work really quickly, because my response to Heather's questions are going to depend on kind of which of these lanes you're trying to pick. Uh, language center work, by that I mean work where the language skills are your main toolkit. It's not a secondary, it's not an add-on, it's not something that's optional, right? So I knew people in my Spanish major that 
paired Spanish with hospitality. So they learned the hospitality skills that they needed, but they picked up Spanish so that they could go serve a hotel in Cancun or Costa Rica, right? I don't consider that to be language centered work. That's not your central skill set. That's not the core of what you're doing. But language center work, it's as far as I'm aware, uh, and you could certainly disagree with me, I'd be happy to hear questions. It's gonna come down to four things. Number one is gonna be academia. You all know them because you're currently in academia, which means you're gonna be getting a PhD or well, probably a PhD if you're trying to do long-term in the language, the literature, linguistics, or some kind of regional studies. Uh, there are pros and cons to academia. Uh, you are gonna be getting really good at something very specific. So the man that I TA'd for had a PhD in Russian poetry. And that's a very, you know, if you want to be in academia, you don't mind being in academia and you're ready to deal with the ins and outs of that. Absolutely, you can go for it, especially if that's your passion. You really like Pushkin. And I'm not ever going to tell the man that he should not ever pursue Pushkin because he could go get a better paying job with Russians somewhere else. So general pros of academia. Uh, once you're in it, you're in it. Cons are going to be you're in for a long haul of graduate degree, PhD, postdoc, adjunct, professorship, and then you're trying to get tenure. And if you're getting something really, really, really specific, it, all of your skills may not be super transferable outside the academic sphere. Uh, second type is going to be government work, local, national, international. So local government work could be course interpreting for a city, uh, that is not an uncommon job. It's a demanding job, but it is a thing. National work is if you're trying to go to, you know, Washington, Department of State, Department of Defense, uh, get into contracting. And the government is either the client or not even necessarily Washington. I have friends that, well, you know, we'll hold it there for now because that's a whole separate discussion. And international, if you want to go be an interpreter at the UN, you can go be an interpreter at the UN. I'm telling you that if, you need three languages to get into the UN as an interpreter. And if English is one of your languages, the other has to be French. And then the third one's up to you. Freelancing, which is what I can talk about more, is indep or independent contracting. It's what a lot of people call it. A lot of my clients call it independent contracting, especially when you're signing documents, signing NDAs and things. Uh, it's very job dependent, but you get out of it, let's put it that way. And we're gonna go into this now in just a second, but you can be extremely flexible, right? So you're not locked into a path. You're not locked into any kind of lifestyle or any kind of specific set of terminology. But if we're talking about in-house gigs, which is sector specific almost all the time, and will almost always involve localization, which is what Heather was referring to. Uh, in-house gigs are the unicorns, if you wanna put it that way of language work, which means you are being hired full time by a single company to perform a single task, which is either translation slash localization. So you are taking a foreign language and putting it into English with the appropriate cultural references and everything like that. And I call in-house gigs unicorns for an obvious reason. There are not many of them. They are hard to come by. Um, and I honestly cannot name a single person that has an in-house gig like that because the scale of company that you have to be dealing with or the clientele has to be so specific that the opportunities are just not as numerous as they are for freelancing. Freelancing is you can just sign up on a website and start doing it today. Um, but if you're trying to do something that specifically involves localization, right? I have a, my alumni mentee is trying to do this and we did some research on video game companies that require Chinese, which is the language that he's trying to use for localization. And there are opportunities out there, but they're not going to be just on the front first top. They're not going to be on the Google top five search results. So this is not meant to dissuade you from trying to find these kind of localization based gigs where you are working full time for a single company. But you need to look them up. And in any case, if you're trying to do the localization thing, Heather, you definitely want to get as much language-based work experience under your belt as you can. Because when you look at job requirements, they're all going to say one year of relevant experience, two years of relevant experience. 
in translating or interpreting or both or localization, which is just, you're just playing in semantics at that point. Um, freelancing pros and cons. And again, there's a few asterisks here that we can dig into. Pros, you set your own schedule and you set your own price. This is a luxury that you get more of the longer that you play the game, right? But you know, when you do finally get to a steady amount of workflow where you're doing X amount of work per day and you know that you have Y amount coming in, so there's a constant flow that you're regulating and you know, that's good for your budget, that's good for your sleep schedule, it's exactly where you want to be, and you can work as much as you want. Uh, portfolio building. To my point that I just said, Heather, and for everybody else, you can start freelancing today if you would like to. You can start collecting work that you have done into a portfolio. And then when you get out of Penn State, you can reference this portfolio uh, as work experience because it really is work experience. It genuinely is. If you're being paid to perform a translation task for someone online, I would absolutely consider that to be work experience. And you will know more of what you're talking about, which is always good. Pros, variety of work. Some people don't like monotony in their work. Um, so you definitely get a good variety of stuff that's just all over the place when you're freelancing. If you name any topic area, I've translated, I'm just very, 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 very likely that I've translated something in it. The demand is high as well, which is very good news. Um, Right, so it's a very flooded market, but the demand is also very high, especially if you are offering services that are competitive, right? So this is for critical languages, if you know something that not many people know. And this doesn't mean like, you know, Arabic is a critical language because statistically speaking, fewer people in the States know it. Um, but my high demand comes from the fact that I know Russian and Ukrainian. And most of the people in the world that know Russian or Ukrainian are not native English speakers. So I'm capitalizing on that by offering my translation services and saying, look, I'll give you the native English, you give me the Russian and Ukrainian. And that's like my niche, right? And there's lower competition in there. But depending on your language pair, your experience, what kind of translation interpretation you're trying to do, what kind of services you're trying to offer, that's going to vary for you. But there is less competition than you may think. Uh, the market is flooded, and that means the market is flooded with C students. I don't know any other way to put that, as well as people that think Google Translate can actually do translation work. So if you can offer something that's better and a pleasant client experience, you're just going to be you're going to be totally fine. Uh, and finally, if you are an American citizen or I believe a permanent resident, it is not terrible. Well. In general, not even just for Americans, it's not terribly complicated legally at all or tax wise, because any large freelancing platform is going to have tools that you can use to report your income. You just need to deal with that once a year, and that'll be that. So, chat, something is happening in the chat. That's just me, Ben, just letting oh. them know that they can <laughs> put their questions Sorry about in that. Q&A. No, we're no almost, problem. Yeah, we're almost done here, folks. Oh, yeah, take your time. Yeah. Uh, cons are going to be at the beginning, right? So this is the this is the critical asterisk here. The startup, the snowball, that initial descent, where your little snowflake turns into this giant avalanche, is a little time consuming because you are just kind of throwing yourself out on the internet with no reference, no reviews, maybe not all that much experience. You don't have a digital presence. Um, and you don't have like an in-person office, obviously, you're not doing brick and mortar work that shows your clients that you're a trusted translator, you know what you're doing, you've handled projects of all sizes, X, Y, Z. So the initial investment that you have with your initial time, your initial money and effort is going to be a little higher, but I would still encourage you to do it as soon as possible if you're having any thoughts about doing this at all, because even if you only do like translate one page a month, you do that 12 times a year, you have a year of job experience, right? Uh, this is not a, this is a soft con, if I can put it that way, but your clients are going to be often unfamiliar with language work. Uh, sometimes they will be translators themselves. Sometimes they will just be secretaries or headhunters or recruiters. 
that are just expecting a result from you and they don't understand how translation works. They don't necessarily understand why you do your job better than Google Translate does. And you need to be ready for that. Uh, double asterisk here is for projects that require intensive research. There are some that do require intensive research. If you think about the comparative complexity between a text message conversation that you have with a friend when you're trying to, I don't know, head down to Sharkies or something like that, and a legal manual, right? Like a hundred page legal contract or an audit report or an engineering manual. The levels of complexity of those texts, those that language is vastly different. And if you're not familiar with a certain subject area, especially with things like legal or scientific, chemical, things like this, you are going to be doing, putting in some research at the beginning in order to be able to translate things correctly. I think that's kind of a cool aspect because it's also the flip side of that is after you put the work in once, the second time is going to be way easier then the third time is going to be way easier. And that just is kind of a, a parabola, if you want to think about it, of your life being easier, easier, easier every single time you do it. And it means that you're then able to take more money for that kind of thing. You become an expert in legal translation, cool. You'll make a killing. You become an expert in translating ads, advertisements, marketing, cool. The demand for ads and marketing stuff is crazy. And that's localization too. And then this last con, which again, sort of a soft con, you get this uh, sense of jack of all trades, master of none, which it doesn't necessarily bother me at all. Uh, you're not going to just, you will, at the beginning especially, you will not probably be able to put in the specific work it takes to become like a career, like a literary translator, right? Someone like my Russian one professor who has done amazing translation work. This guy's translated Stephen King, um, other really big names, but that's like his thing. He translates literature. It's the only thing he does, he's excellent at it. But if you offer him a bunch of money to translate a legal thing, he'd probably turn you down because there's probably someone that's better qualified to do that. So that bothers some people, but that's why I included that as a con, but again, more of a soft con. Uh, general tips, since we're getting into tips, it's going to be find a platform that allows you to play this numbers game in a flooded market as opposed to a price point game, right? So there are certain freelance platforms like Fiverr, uh, guru to an extent, people per hour, and I'll list these all at the end. I have a resources slide where I'll just stop the presentation and take your questions. Uh, where Fiverr is more bidding for static tasks, things like I'll write, I'll copyright 100 words for you, or I'll design a vector image for you. And you're just fighting to compete with the lowest possible prices, whereas for translation, every project is so custom. You know, I have a general number, how, how much I charge per page, but it depends, uh, depends on a million things. It depends on the difficulty of the text. It depends on how urgently the client needs it. It depends on um, the quality of the text, right? Am I reading a doc Word document or am I reading like a horrible scan from 1985? And these all kind of come into play. So freelancing, I would just say literally Google it, do 15 minutes of Google research and find out which platforms you can start on. Uh, that'll best allow you to play your specific type of numbers game for the language pairs you need. Obviously, someone that knows like Chinese is going to be, have a vastly different market than someone that knows Spanish or Portuguese. So I can't answer every question for all of you right now, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, for those of us that are American permanent residents or citizens, if you have the ability to register a US-based address, do so. I would recommend it. Uh, Upwork, the platform that I spend most of my time on, has incentives for US-based addresses in that they give you access to US-based jobs because some American-based clients want their job to be done by an American. And the prices on those contracts are usually much higher. Like I said, like 40% on average higher. Uh, in general, like I said, be ready to work for a little less at the outset. You know, Don't sell yourself for nothing. Uh, but do play the long game, right? So you need to look at this as something that's going to take six-ish months 
to really get going, really get snowballing if you put time into it. And that's okay. You definitely have six months. Six months is like a semester plus change, if you want to think about it that way. Um, in general, put time and effort into proposals. Don't be afraid to get moral, or sorry, don't be afraid to get personal. If you, a lot of the clients that I have um, have projects that are very near and dear to their heart. So I'm doing a family memoir right now about a emigre from Ukraine to the United States. And it's, I Skype the family and we talked to them about everything and we found their family history and it's very personal. So the, per, the, the people come to freelancers because they often want that individualized attention. They don't wanna go through an agency uh, where they're just another number and another file, right? So don't be afraid to, you know, reference things that you've done that are relevant. Be a little personal. Uh, if some aspect of the job is especially relevant to you, tell them. Know your standards and limits and morals and communicate them honestly. This is the uh, cover your rear principle, but we're all adults here. So I say this specifically because any freelance platform you're going to start on is uh, client-sided, it's client-based, and the clients, I mean, the clients are the ones that put the money on the platform, right? So on Upwork, if someone puts in 100 bucks for a job, Upwork takes a piece of that and the freelancer gets the rest. So all of these platforms have a huge incentive to keep clients happy which is why you as a freelancer need to be very careful about communicating your standards and your limits. I only say morals because um, you do need to have an idea about that as well. I'm not trying to say that the economy is full of people that are super shady, but you know, for example, I did recently have a client that I did one or two smaller jobs with and I felt that the service that they were offering was taking advantage of people. So I stopped working with that client. I did not tell that client necessarily. No, I didn't throw it up in their face and say, you're a con artist. You're horrible. I'm reporting you to the authorities. I just said, you know, I'm overloaded. Please do not contact me anymore with future work. I apologize for the inconvenience. Step away. We communicate honestly and politely. But again, final and most important thing is going to be start ASAP. If you have any interest, you want to make any money just start asap it's a positive sum game you have time that you're spending and one of two things is going to happen number one you're going to learn how to adver advertise yourself better write better proposals you're going to make money your language skills are going to get better and you're going to have much more experience for when you actually really need to apply to things like grad school jobs it is a positive sum game no matter how you look at it a few resources just to drop up on the screen and i do say a few because it's very hard to generalize <laughs> all language pairs in the world. Um, if you have any interest in working for the government, uh, which requires linguist positions that require a clearance, uh, definitely check out clearancejobs.com. These things are gonna be mostly based around Washington, but these are usually single language, language intensive positions. How well do you know Russian? How well do you know Chinese? How well do you know Farsi? You're gonna be doing full time, and that's a very stable job once you get it. LinkedIn and Indeed.com are two job sites, and you all know what LinkedIn is. But they do have, they do have good job alerts, uh, especially if you are looking for something more specific like localization, if you're looking for opportunities. You know, I think that's what you meant when you said internships. Then definitely just throw a few job alerts out there. And even if it's not like in your area, even if it's something that'll pop up when you're still in college, be mindful of what the job advertisement is saying, because that's what you're going to be coming up against when you graduate. So if you see a job advertisement, so like coming back to Heather's example, she wants to do localization for a company. She finds a company that's offering the perfect job she wants, but they need an urgent hire in two weeks. Maybe you can't fill that right now, but you'll know exactly what they're looking for and you can prep for that which is also knowledge is power. And then freelancer platforms, like I said, Upwork is my main thing, but there are also places like P5 or People Per Hour and Guru. And there's a, you know, there's a million. Uh, I would say play the numbers game, stick on platforms that have a huge number of users because it's, you know, it's a, it's a funnel just like anything else. So you need a bigger user base to increase your chances of getting a proposal or a profile view or a contract. And then you might be competitive with a few other people for that contract. And then from that competition, 
you hopefully win the contract, but make things easier for yourself. Uh, don't register for every weird platform that only has 1,000 users on it because it'll just be burning your time. And let's hit that Q&A from Yushi. We have freelancing work, the question, I'll read the question then. For freelancing work, translation, for example, I wonder how to reach out to clients, where to find job opportunities and project offers. Excellent question. I don't know if I have to answer this live or not, but we're just gonna come back here. Yushi, I would say you have a few ways to do this. Find a freelancer platform, I'm assuming, I'd like to answer this question live, okay? Find a, uh, you know, figure out what your language pair is in your direction. If you're comfortable going in both directions with your translation, you know, going from English into language X and language X into English, that's great. But be very clear about what you're ready to offer and just make freelancer accounts, honestly. Um, the demand is there. I just, I can't put it any other way. I can jump onto Upwork any other day and I see all sorts of stuff. Today I saw Yiddish, French, Spanish, Chinese. Um, so the, the need for this language work to be done by humans exists. And there's a bunch of people that are either have their random projects or, again, this is sort of a separate conversation, but translation agencies, you know, where you Google them and you see these massive translation agencies that offer a hundred language pairs. You know, they have African languages that no one's ever heard of and they can give you like a cereal box translation into that language. Those agencies largely work by reaching out to freelancers. They get a database of translators. And then when a job pops up, they email the translator. So be, uh, you know, throw yourself up on LinkedIn, Yushi, throw yourself up on a few of these places. I always, like I said, I would recommend Upwork. It's free to register. It doesn't cost anything to work there um, other than the commission that they take, but that's everywhere. Everywhere takes commission. And make a sleek profile, you know, make it look good. If you have any kind of translation work you can upload as like a sample, definitely do it. And just be honest about what you offer and I think if you want to put in job proposals, they give you free, like there's an internal currency that you can use to apply for stuff. But if you want to buy more, it costs pennies. So throw yourself out there, get those initial reviews and you'll be off to the races. Good luck. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll also um, be happy to put out my business email at the end of this presentation if you have any more specific questions about any of this. If I've addressed your question and if I haven't, I'm sorry, but then please clarify your question again and I'll do my best to answer it. Heather says, if our language ability is not as high, do people use cat tools in aiding their translations and then cleaning it up to give it more of a, open quotes, human, close quotes, touch? They do. Cat tools are very common. Uh, certain jobs and certain people want you to use cat tools. So I have a cat tool that I use called Trados, SDL. It's a tremendous, tremendous resource, um, especially when you can link it to well, this is more of a technical thing, but you can use a combination of internal software that you program based off of like technical terms and glossaries, as well as a Google machine learning base, right? So it's not Google Translate. It's something more personalized, which is why I usually use cat tools for projects that are very industry specific with a lot of very, very, you know, A equals B jargon. And language ability is not as high. People definitely use cat tools all the time. You do not understand. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've had someone throw a document at me in English that they just literally copied and pasted into Google translate.com. Sorry, translate.google.com. And then they sent it to me saying, Ben, here's a completed translation. Can you edit it? Because I know editing is cheaper. And it's, you know, probably two, three weeks ago, I had a document where I got three to four lines into it. And I said, this is machine translation. Obviously a native speaker never looked at this. I am only gonna to touch this if you pay me for the translation. And they didn't want that. So that was the end of that transaction, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, if your language ability is quote, not as high, uh, cat tools are a great way for you to start learning what 
you know, in the other language is going to look like in English because I also probably should put this in the presentation, but I think every translation has two steps. And I think the two steps are vital, especially when you're translating into your native language. Step number one is producing a text in your native language, right? So this is where the language ability is not as high kind of comes into play. But the second step is once you have, let's just use an example. I'm doing a translation for a bunch of jewelry, uh, jewelry things for an online store right now. So first step for me is I put all the jewelry descriptions into English. And I'm going to let that sit for at least a few hours. Second step is I come back to the English text that I have prepared. My brain is now in English mode, right? So I'm not doing, you know, Ukrainian and Russian in English out. It's a different mental process for me. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe you're smart enough that you can do it all in one step, but I'm not. So second step is coming back to the English and editing it slash proofreading it slash tweaking it to give it that real native English flavor because you don't need, you know, super crazy mega native, uh, you know, ILDR5 language skills in order to understand that it's not going to be A equals B a lot of the time. You're going to have to tweak, you're going to have to reword, you're going to have to substitute in certain cases, especially with like creative writing and a few other places. So yes, cat tools are a thing. Uh, there are free ones out there, but if you're ever getting serious or you have a big project, it's definitely worth it putting down the money for it, put it that way. And that's all that I have for everybody right now. Sorry that I spent a little longer on myself than I thought I was going to, but if you have any more questions, I would certainly be happy to provide any more information. Yes, please do feel free to throw out your questions in the Q&A, or as, as I said, um, you can use the raise hand feature and I'll be able to allow you to talk um, to speak your question. Um, and Ben, yes, if you don't mind um, putting in the chat your email um, yes. that you had mentioned um, for those that would have maybe some further questions and would like to network with you and kind of dig deeper into uh, some questions, um, that would be wonderful. Um, and Ben also mentioned um, about his mentee uh, that he has. Um, so as a liberal arts student, you have the capability to um, be a part of the alumni mentor program, which I will put in the um, chat as well. Um, I'll put the link for that. Um, it's a great opportunity uh, to reach out and be a, a matched with a, uh, it's, it's all hand matched um, with a mentor of somebody who has some of the same similar interests as you, uh, as far as like wh where you would like, what you would like to do for work, um, majors, that kind of thing. So um, I'll be putting that here in the chat as well. That's perfect, Ben. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Hoff. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free yeah, to throw them Don't out. be shy. I mean, nope. I know it was a lot, but Okay, you, Lillian has proficiency in three foreign languages, my goodness gracious, but I'm not sure if it would be better to really focus on developing one of those or to try to work on all three. Lillian, uh, if I may, I need to know what your goals are, I need to know what your interests are, and I would need to know what the languages are to give you a better answer. Uh, it depends on the kind of work that you want to do. So I can only answer your question extremely generally. Can you give me any more information about either what you're trying to do with the language work or what languages we're talking here slash what kind of things could be interesting for you? You know, what kind of work? Like, are you trying to be a court interpreter? Or are you trying to uh, you know, localize a video game? Or are you trying to look at maybe translating a book? Or what are you thinking about? Lillian, I gave you a capability to uh, speak. So if you would like to uh, answer some of those questions. Three, four languages. Perfect. OK. French, Arabic, Arabic, Hungarian, not sure what you want to do, because the UN work, in which case you would work on all three, but you're not sure. Uh, the UN is going to ask you for three. 
And like I said, you have if you have French and Arabic and English, you're basically set to go. Um, the UN and any other kind of big intergovernmental organization, you know, on an international level is going to be drowning in bureaucracy. I'm just saying that right off the bat, not to deter you, but to prepare you. It's going to take you a year minimum to become an interpreter or a translator for the UN if you want to go to a big, uh, a big, big organization like that. And if that is what you're thinking about, all I can say is go for it. They're going to put you through a lot of testing. The testing is going to be very intensive and you need to dis decide whether or not you want to be a translator or an interpreter because those are two different positions at the UN. You obviously have English. Um, so you have the English French mandatory pairing that they have. So you actually have quite a lot of opportunity here. Um, French, Arabic and Hungarian. So you have, I know, the doors are all open for you. I'm not sure what your language levels are for all of these. Hungarian is a very rare thing for someone outside of Hungary to have. Uh, so I don't see it popping up terribly often. But then again, I don't live in Hungary and I don't, you know, like I'm Ukraine borders Hungary. So I'm sure that there are people that like work for it and require Hungarian translators and things like that. But you know, it doesn't. Hungarian doesn't benefit from the numbers that English, French, and Arabic do. So that's definitely something to consider. Uh, if your Arabic is good, like I mean, if your Arabic is near native fluent, or you're not, not you know, you're ready to take a government test on it, uh, the government will hire you now. The government will hire you immediately, depending on where you want to work. So if you want to work at a three-letter agency, uh, or if you want to kind of try to go abroad with it, um, the other I will say one more thing in terms of just general government-based work. There is a large sector of jobs where the government is the person paying the bill. So there's a contracting company that wins a multi-million dollar contract for especially things like Arabic, things like Farsi, uh, and they hire linguists that are very high level, very proficient, or not super like good enough to do one specific thing, you know? So like there are people that sit in offices and just read uh, what Russian troll farms generate all day. So they have to have, you know, this crazy high reading score. They have to be really, really good at reading, but they can be bad at speaking because they're never gonna talk for that job, right? So I have friends that have applied for jobs like this and native speakers of things like Russian where they just crush the reading exam or they crush the listening exam, but they they get like an F on interpreting and they still get the job because the job doesn't require interpreting. It's just kind of a bureaucratic formality. So you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of, a lot of, what's the word I'm looking for? Flexibility, pardon me. But the French is gonna be the least in demand obviously because the French, no French, and the UN knows French and a lot of Africa knows French. So it's honestly, I mean, like I said, it's a zero sum game with the trends, with the freelancing. So if you want to try just translating stuff, getting a sense of it, take a few projects, do a few pages, things like that. Because the flip side of everyone speaking French is that everybody needs things translated into and from French. So do not be afraid to try. But the UN, you definitely need to prep in advance for that. So if you are not a senior, if you are a senior, start thinking about it now and researching the process because it's nuts. And if you're not a senior, get ready to start researching it. Great question though, thank you. That was a long answer, I apologize. Yeah, some great questions. Anyone else, any last question for Ben? All right. Well, if no further questions, um, Ben, again, thank you so much um, for joining us and taking time out of your uh, evening, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we do have a, a couple of things that were, I'll uh, share my screen here so that you can uh, see here. Uh, so just a couple of things um, we have going on. We have the online French um, job fair, which I will come back to that here so you can see that. That's coming up on March 20th. So if that's of interest to you, 
Um, that is not something that we are doing. It's organized through Handshake, but you'll see the um, information there on your screen. Um, it'll be from 2 to 5 p.m. on March the 20th. So um, there's a QR code that you can scan there um, if that's of interest. Um, and then we also have uh, next, uh, next Friday, the 26th, um, leveraging your liberal arts degree in the consulting interview process. Um, with one of our current students who's a senior in econ, um, recently hired by McKinsey. Um, so he'll be speaking uh, about those that as well. And then you'll also see here, we've got um, all of the uh, YouTube channel, um, the QR code there, if you wanna scan that um, with your phone. We do have all of the webinars and things that we have had uh, within the Career Enrichment Network. Um, great to subscribe to that again. So I would um, definitely take advantage of that so that you'd be able to have that uh, as a resource. And lastly, we have our QR code here for texting uh, updates. So if you'd prefer that over an email. Um, and then we also have our live chat. So again, just some resources. Again, as we're all still online um, and we want you to be able to have all the resources uh, as possible. So. Um, but again, Ben, thank you so much. Um, it doesn't look like uh, there might be some other here in the chat. Uh, nope, perfect. Okay, yeah. so everybody got their questions answered. And of course, Ben did put his email address in there as well. Uh, so feel free to grab that in the chat um, if you'd like to connect with him. So thanks so much, Ben. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All right, everybody take care and uh, we'll see you all soon.